Okay, I think almost everybody's back. Um, thanks for being willing to take the break early. Uh, hopefully everybody was okay with that. Uh, and everybody online, we're gonna go ahead and get started again here in just a second. So, just to recap where we left off last time. We had a uh, flux spectrum that we plotted, but as noted, very aptly noted by uh, somebody that asked a question saying, what are the units of this flux? Because looking at this, right, uh, we expect the flux to be much, much higher, of course, in a, in a true reactor. So uh, one, one piece of this uh, is that is the flux units themselves. And again, I'll just go back to the scores section of specifying tallies in OpenMC so that we can look and see that flux, flux, flux. Ah, that the units of flux are in particle centimeter per source particle. So, flux unnormalized, okay, is going to have units of particles centimeter per source particle. So, for every source particle, producing a certain track length, essentially a certain distance traveled through our pen cell. The plain English version of what that means, what those units mean. Now to get from a flux, we're trying to get to units that are physical. So this is going to be particle per centimeter squared second. Uh, so to do this, we need to uh, compute two factors as part of our Monte Carlo model. The first one is going to be the volume. The second one is going to be uh, a power normalization or a neutron source, right? So this is going to be particles. That symbol as well. Source particles per second. So if we look at all these units together, starting with our unnormalized flux particle, source particle, uh, thank you, thank you. Hopefully this is a little bit better. Sorry about that. So, uh, quick recap. The units, the unnormalized flux that comes out of our Monte Carlo code is in units of particle centimeter per source particle. And we need to compute a normalization to get us to the physical units of particle per centimeter squared per second. So we're just gonna go through that as an exercise together. Uh, the two components to this that we need is one, the volume in uh, cubic centimeters. And then second, the source in source particles per second. So this is our neutron source rate as a result of the fission system that we're working in. So first, uh, we're going to divide by the volume. So this is gonna be one over centimeter to the third. And then we're gonna multiply by our source rate. Okay, so when we look, go through this, our units are going to kind of cancel here. This will become centimeters squared. Our source particle term will cancel. And that's going to result in the units that we want, which is particle. Oh, no, particle per centimeter squared per second. Okay, so we'll do this in two steps. The first one that we'll do is going to be the volume. And this one's relatively straightforward for the model that we're working in. If you're trying to determine the flux in, say, a specific material or a specific region of the model, we do have the ability to do volume calculations in OpenMC. So if you have a really unique or complicated shape, you can tell OpenMC, like, hey, I want you to run a simulation and tell me at the end of that simulation what's the volume of that cell so that this becomes a lot easier. Now, but for us, um, because of the way that we specified our pin cell, we know that the volume here 
is just going to be based on the pitch, the pin cell pitch. Now we're working with a 2D model, so all of the units, we do have to do a little bit of mental gymnastics because all of the units that we're looking at are going to be uh, per unit length into the page. So this is a 2D model, so really our volume here is going to be an area, but it's going to be an area per unit centimeter, if that makes sense. Or you can think of this, or you could think of this whole model as just being one centimeter deep into the board. That might be an easier way to think about it, a couple of different ways to go. So we'll go ahead and compute the volume. For our model, that's relatively easy. It's just going to be the pitch multiplied by the pitch. Now one thing I will say, and we can just go ahead and look at what that is. Yeah. Uh, the K effective value, that's a good point. Um, I was gonna kinda skip over that part, but yeah, we can go ahead and account for that. So. Uh, we'll get into that more when we talk about the source term, though, okay? But I'll make sure to include that. Uh, yeah, we'll just do the volume for now. We'll get to that in the source term. So for the, uh, with regards to the volume, uh, I just want to mention a couple other pieces of the property of the model object that we're working with. So when we look at the geometry, we can do things like automatically compute the, ask it to compute the bounding box of our geometry. And so if we do this, it's gonna go through and look at all the surfaces, the relationship between these surfaces according to the CSG specification, and then try to determine a bounding box. Now we know this is a 2D model and we see that reflected in this bounding box because we have an infinite uh, value in the Z, um, Z dimension for the min and max of this bounding box. But here we see that we are in fact, you know, half the pitch in each direction. And we could have used this to compute the volume as well. Okay, now, so for the remaining piece, to get the neutron source is slightly more tricky. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and... So the way that we're gonna compute the neutron source is we're gonna need a couple of things. One, we're gonna need that kappa value that we had before which is going to come to us in EV per source particle. Right? And then we're also going to need a power for our model, which is just going to be watts or joules per second. Right? And equivalently, we'll be able to write this in um, So, what we're going to do here to compute our neutron source is we're Start with our one over the kappa value. That's going to give us source particle per EV, right? And then we are going to take our power and simply multiply by our power converted to EV per second. That's going to give us units of source particle per second. Now there was a really good point made here because for systems that are far from critical, or far from a k-effective value of one, our source term is actually changing uh, from generation to generation if we were to physically model this. The number of neutrons in our system is increasing. And so there's a couple of different ways to handle this um, for systems far from critical. The most common one is probably to divide by the, the k-effective value here. So we can adjust and just say, we're using the source term from the previous generation of neutrons. Okay, but there's a lot of different ways to handle this. You could take the average of, you know, the K effective value in one or something like that as well. But it is important to account for, especially in systems that are far from uh, critical. So I'll include that term here as well. That is going to give us our resulting neutron source. But uh, if we recall last time, we kind of... Well, we already have this information, actually, so we don't need to produce another tally. Right. <clears throat> so, what we'll go ahead and do is determine a pin cell power. This is something that the Monte Carlo code is not going to provide to us. This is something we need to know a priori as an input to the simulation. 
uh, because what the Monte Carlo code is really providing to us is a shape of our flux, of our power distribution, and it's all unnormalized. It's all, in a reactor sim situation, it's all normalized to the power. But that shape, that flux shape and uh, distribution is not, the power does not determine that, right? Like it's not, the shape of the flux does not tell you what power the reactor at, is at. The neutron population and fission rate tells you what the power is at. And so, you know, that's just a parameter that's separate from the Monte Carlo simulation. So for our case here, we're gonna compute the power using kind of something that, that is approximate, to be clear, that G1 and I put together. Um, so our, in this model of CEFR, the total power, so originally this would be in megawatts, is 65 megawatts. Well, I guess it's in watts, sorry. So it's 65 megawatts. We have 79 assemblies. So we're gonna divide that total power by 79 because we're looking at a pin cell from one assembly. And then we're also gonna divide by the number of pins in a single assembly. And in CEFR, there are 61 pins in a, in a single assembly. And then the final adjustment that we have to make is that our power is per centimeter. So if we were to just use this value here, that would represent the total power for the entire length of the core. But we're doing a 2D calculation and all of our parameters are per centimeter. So we're gonna be dividing by, I think 200's a little high, honestly. Isn't it like 40 centimeters high? This, this, just this section of the, oh, uh, 80 centimeters? Okay, so 80 centimeters. So we'll adjust that value. And the end result here is that we have watts per centimeter. And we should have, what did we call that value previously? I'm trying to remember the name of our, we have MEV per fission, right, just capo, okay. So we have MEV per fission above, I'm just gonna compute it in EV per fission. Remember for the same system, we already computed this value. That's just going to be kappa vision, fission divided by the fission rate. Um, so now we need to take our power. So we'll say this is the pin cell power. And we're going to convert that to EV. So we get equivalent uh, units here. So that just means that we need to multiply by times, whoops. Cell power divided by our constant 1e to the minus 19 EV per joule. Yep. So then our neutron source rate is going to be equal to the power, so the pin cell power in EV. We're gonna divide by the EV per fission. And then we'll also divide by our K effective, which we can get from the state point file pretty easily, but since it's up here in the output, we'll just grab it like that, 1.48, 1.47, 1.4784. Minus, that must be what happened there. Okay, so for a single pin cell per centimeter, right, this is going to be our neutron source rate.
Now that we have that, we're going to kind of borrow some of this code above for our, uh, for our plot that we did of the flux spectrum. Put it here. And really the only change that we're going to need to make is we're going to take our flux spectrum, so we'll call this the normalized. is going to be the flux spectrum from before. We're going to divide by our volume. So each value in that flux spectrum will be divided by the volume. Whoops, didn't mean to execute that quite yet. And we'll go ahead and flatten this also. Um, so we'll divide by the volume. And then beforehand here, we will multiply by the neutron source term. Oh, and then we need to make sure that when we plot, we're passing it the new array. So our normalized. And syntax error. There we go. So um, that's kind of the process generally for how you will adjust, and I should update the label here because we are now working with particle per centimeter squared second. Okay. Any questions, any thoughts there? All right, good, good. Um, the next thing we're going to do is, are there any questions online? Do you want, are we doing okay? All right, cool. Sorry, I just wanted to check real quick. Uh, so the next thing we're going to do is look at uh, tallying different reaction types by material in an open, C, open MC problem. Um, this one should be relatively brief, this exercise. Um, so just for uh, a reminder of what's in our model, we're just going to take a look at the materials again. We have fuel, steel, Fuel, steel, helium, sodium. Okay, so now we're going to do, and there was a question about this earlier, so hopefully this is uh, helpful to that person, but we're gonna create what's called a material filter. Oops, material filter. And what this is gonna take in is just a set of OpenMC materials. And we can just pass these materials on, from our model straight in. Uh, if I didn't make a syntax error, I don't need this extra closing bracket. So it can just be model.materials. Bill, <laughs> sorry, I must be getting tired. <laughs> We can take a look at that material filter. So here the material filter is just telling us it has a filter ID of four. It's another one of these objects in OpenMC that automatically gets assigned IDs as you create them. And we've created some filters already. Uh, the bins of this filter are the IDs of the different materials. We can see that here. So your sodium is 12, helium has an ID of 11, steel has an ID of 13, fuel has an ID of nine. We see those appear here. Uh, we are going to use this in a tally, so we'll call this a, a reaction tally, because we're going to be tallying some different reaction rates in these different materials. We're just going to say, let's create this tally, and then set the scores. So the scores will tally, let's tally fission. We'll tally absorption and scattering. And then for the tally, we're going to add this filter. So the tally filters is going to be a list of different filters. And the only one that we really want to look at in this case is just going to be our material filter. Then we can print that tally just to see. Uh, oh, uh, I set it on our old tally object instead of the reaction tally. 
So I need to correct that real quick. This is why we check things, I suppose, and print them out. So now if we print that out, uh, we can see that I have in fact applied our scores and filters that we originally intended. Um, let's see. And now, just like we did before when we were switching out tallies, we can do that pretty easily in the model just by supplying a new tallies collection object. And we pass to that collection a list of tallies, so in this case, just the reaction tally. And then we can rerun our problem, getting the new state point file. And off we go. Oh. Did I spell something wrong here? Scatter, maybe, instead of scattering. Check. scatter. So, yeah. We'll go ahead and recreate that tally, correct the score, and then run OpenMC. Looks like it finished up just fine. Yeah, sure. Sorry, that was kind of scattered because I made so many errors, <laughs> typos in there. Apologies. All set? I'm doing good. Was there an issue? Are we all, did everybody catch up, Anna? Are you ready to go? Okay, cool. No rush. I just wanted to, I just wanted to check in before I go on. All right. Uh, so our simulation executed, and now we're going to use this uh, command with OpenMC. State point, state point file as SP. We'll get that tally out of it. So we'll, what do we call this? Uh, call this reaction tally out. And we'll say get our tally. And that ID should have a, react, should have a tally that matches reaction tally ID. Okay, and just real quick. We'll print that tally. Had double I in there, so I'm just gonna correct that real quick. And we'll see that it has our material filter and our three scores that we wanna see. So this is gonna be kind of an exercise in looking at why we do things in Python, um, or one of the pieces of our philosophy on why we do things in Python. And it's because we can leverage these really useful, um, useful tools, useful packages that are developed by a really a much broader community than just our Neutronics community, and we can really benefit from that. So one thing we can do um, is to produce what's called da pandas data frames. And so I'm not sure if people are necessarily familiar with this, but they're a really nice way to be able to manipulate and vi visualize tables of data. So in a situation like this where we have like categorical data for different materials and different um, reaction types in those materials, it's a really useful way to look at these things. So for the reaction tally out, we can just tell that tally to produce us a pandas data frame. And then when we just execute a cell, with that pandas data frame in it, or I think even if we print it, I would hope. Oh, it's less. It's actually less pretty when you print it, which is interesting, but still nicely organized. 
Um, so if you just execute a cell, it'll give you this kind of nicely formatted and printed information about the different materials we're looking at, the different nuclides, uh, which we're tallying for all nuclides in this case, and the different scores along with their mean and standard deviation. So a really easy thing to parse, like with very uh, little effort, essentially. And then we can even leverage that data frame to do some pretty convenient plotting. Uh, we can add information to it as well. So we can do things like tell me the data frame. We're going to do a, add a normalized mean to this. So we're going to tell it that the category for normalized mean for each of these scores is going to be equal to the values of the data frame for the mean. So it's going to extract everything in this table here or, uh, that's under the mean column and then multiply that by our neutron source. That will have added a category for the normalized mean. So this is a total reaction rate, so the total number of reactions in our unit cell per second. Uh, let's see, what else, what other fun stuff can we do with this? Uh, we can extract specific um, reaction types really easily. So if we want to look at only information in a data frame uh, where the score is equal to fission, or let's see, uh, it's actually going to be four. That'll kind of filter down, whoops. Right, 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 right. So this is gonna give us the set of locations in the column where the score is equal to uh, fission. And then if we kind of filter out those entries by selecting them in the data frame, that will give us a fission data frame where we're really only looking at the, uh, the fission score for each of the different materials that we have. So it's like a really good way of just extracting those and also just doing kind of a sanity check here that yeah, we're not really producing fission in anything but our fuel material in this case. And then finally, you can produce plots uh, really, really easily with this kind of um, object in Python. And so we'll go ahead and tell the fission data frame, generate a plot. On the x-axis, we're going to be using the material. Uh, let's add the material names to this because it's just kind of messy to look at. We're going to add a new uh, entry to this. Where do we add the material names? Uh, oh. uh, four. Well, let's do it. Let's do it without it. Sorry. In the interest of time, we'll just move on. But I think in the solution notebook, uh, it adds the material names in here to give us a slightly prettier plot than the one that I'm going to be producing. So we'll say the x-axis label is going to be the material. And then we're going to have in the y-axis the normalized mean. The type of plot is going to be a bar plot. And we can provide a label pretty easily, I think. Um, so label. So here we go. Uh, this might be a little more interesting if we did something like scattering, I think. So we can do that real quick. I'll just copy this fission data frame down. And instead of generating a data frame based on the fission reaction, we'll do scatter instead. And we can similarly produce a plot pretty easily where just instead of using the fission data frame, we use the scattering data frame. And so here we see we get uh, a lot of scattering in the fuel. I believe this is going to be the stainless steel cladding here, so we just get a little bit relative to other materials, partially due to the volume, partially due to the cross sections. And then finally we get a lot of scattering in our coolant in the sodium, partially, again, due to the size of the sodium relative to other materials and the cross sections. 
Okay, so um, are there any questions on that? I'll leave it up uh, here so we can. There is one simple question. Yeah. Uh, can you plot both scatter and fission on the same graph? Yes, I believe you can. Uh, I am not savvy enough to do it with Python data frames or with pandas data frames. Uh, so I won't probably won't attempt it here, but maybe I'll like show it after the next break or something like that once I've had a chance to play around with it. Oh, okay. Cool. But yeah, it is possible, I guess. That's helpful. Okay. Uh, if there are no additional questions, we're going to move on to kind of the next uh, concept in geometry. We're going to dive deeper into using universes to replicate geometry in OpenMC and start building ourselves toward modeling the full assembly uh, of the CEFR model. So we mentioned a... Um, we mentioned these before, that universes are really just a way to collect a bunch of cells and then use them as the whole geometry or reuse them inside of other cells in the geometry. Uh, so first, before we kind of dive into that, we're going to reapproach making our CEFR pin cell a little bit and use some additional convenience functions to create this collection of cells we're going to insert into a universe. So. Right, okay, sorry. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna make, well, first we're gonna make a toy, a toy pin cell. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, yeah. We're gonna make a toy pin cell just so we can get, build sort of an intuition for what universes mean and also work with a little bit with rotating and translating use universes um, inside of a cell. So to do this, we'll create a relatively simple model. Uh, we just need a outer surface So we'll make a, oh, a Z cylinder, not just a cylinder. And then we'll make that a radius of one. We'll say the inside, uh, the inside of the cylinder is gonna be the inside of the outer surface, which I just realized. correct that. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and make a pin cell. So just a pin cell. The region being the inside of that cylinder. And we'll fill it with our fuel. Sure. We're going to take that uh, let's see, and then we're going to also do the, we're going to make a cell for the outside of the cell. Yeah. Pin cell. That's just going to be the outside of our outer surface, or our surface, really. And we'll go ahead and fill that with our sodium. So a very simplified pin cell model here. So then we'll go ahead and create a temporary universe. And we will add our cells to that universe. And those cells are going to be our pin cell and then the outside of that pin cell. Now we can plot this thing. In this case, I think we do want to provide it with a little bit of info on the width. Right, okay, yeah, yeah. So here we have it plotted. I'll make this a little bit wider so we get a better sense of where we're at here. 
All right, so we have a three by three, uh, three centimeter by three centimeter image here. And here's we, here we have our pin cell. And this one does go all the way out to negative one to one. So I got to dig into that a little bit. I'll report back tomorrow. Um, now, what we can do with this is we can take this geometry. We essentially have a one cylinder with fuel in it, and it's surrounded by sodium. And this goes on forever. So I can kind of just bear that out by saying, you know, if I made this 100 by 100, or maybe not quite that large, but like 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters, and we rerun this, we see that the sodium outside of here just goes and goes and goes, goes on forever. Let's say that we want to build a geometry that's contained, uh, and we want to use these two cells, our finite pin cell and the infinite sodium region to fill another cell. We're going to go ahead and do that. So let's make a, we'll start with the surface. We'll make a big cylinder. So we're going to create a big cylinder, and then we're going to create a big cell. So I'm going to take a shortcut here and say that the region of this cell is just going to be the inside of the big cylinder. I'll put a space here just to make that really clear. And now, the part where we're going to start really leveraging these universes is we're going to create a big cell or sorry, we're going to fill this big cell with instead of a material, we're going to fill it with the universe we created before. So now we've created a larger cell. We have our smaller one inside of it. And it's going to be, when we have the universe that's filling that larger region. So we can get a look at what that is going to look like here in a second. So now we can define a universe. And we're going to add a single cell to it. This is different than our previous calls where we're using add cells. We're going to use add cell. And now, we can go ahead and plot this universe. And so instead of now having a unbounded sodium region, We've taken that infinite sodium region, inserted it into a larger cell, and now we have a finite model that we're looking at. All right, so here's... Show what? Oh, yeah, yeah. This, this plot with regions, if it's borders, it's so good. What is this? What do you mean, uh, Vladimir? Sorry. If you could, you said add cells, temp, u plotter. Uh, temp, u, add cells, plot. Oh, that, uh, for this one, it should, be, you need to provide it a width. Yeah, do you want sketch? Only, only with all, I guess, thank you. Okay. So, now we can do some more fun things with this. Now that we've filled this cell with a universe, we can modify that uh, original surface and then see what happens in terms of how it then is represented inside of the larger cell. So that's what we're going to do. Um, we are going to say, so the outer surface that we created, if I hit period and then look at the uh, in tab complete, it's got a bunch of different information on it. Uh, in particular, what we're going to look at here is these x0 and y0 values. So if I look at x0, it's 0. And y0 is also 0. So we're just going to change those a little bit. We're going to say x0 is going to now be equal to uh, 1.0. And y0 is going to be equal to, let's say, 0 0.5. And now, all of that, and this is something I think really demonstrates the power of this object-based approach in the Python API is we've modified these values on a surface that we've already added to a cell, that's already been added to a universe, and, and these changes that we just made here, we're just gonna show how they propagate all the way up through the geometry so that you can modify things on the fly. There's no need to rebuild or re-execute any of the previous work. Um, it will just update on its own. 
But when we look at big universe, plot that, we see that now our cell is off center, right? It's been adjusted according to this. And we can take that to a little bit of an extreme. Let's say this is 2.5, do it again. So we're getting into a little bit more interactive capability here for adjusting our, um, our geometry. Now, similarly, we can also do something uh, to our cell to adjust the contents within a cell. So there are some times where when we modify this outer surface, if we were to use this inner universe in multiple different places in the geometry, and we modified that outer surface, it's modified everywhere. But if we only wanted to translate this universe inside of one cell, we can do that by setting the big cell translation property. And so we can do something like, let's say, let's just undo this translation and we can see if we can make this pen cell go back to the center of our larger cell. So sure enough, if we were to do this translation or apply this translation, and this is exactly what, it, how it would be represented in transport, it's gonna move the center uh, pin cell, it's gonna move this pin cell back to the center of the larger cell. We can take that further. So if we wanted to, you know, just do this 3.5, it's gonna move it a little bit further over to the left. And similar with the rotation, if we then wanted to take this and rotate it, we can do that as well. Okay, so the rotation, I'm trying to remember. I think it's just gonna be around the axis. It's in degrees around the axis. So I hope it's not radians, but we'll find out. Ah, right, right, right. Uh, let's get rid of the... Set our translation. Run our rotation. Okay, so that was a little funky because the translation that we applied as well as the surface updates were kind of like competing with each other. Um, here we've just done the translation. So if I reset this rotation to zero, we're just looking at the translation, or sorry, the, uh, the surface coefficient changes that we made above. So it's moved over in X 2.5 and a little bit up in Y. But then if we rotate this around the Z axis by 90 degrees, we see we can translate the geometry inside of the cell. Not translate, rotate. Okay, any questions on that? Yes, yeah. Yeah, it's, it really comes down to bookkeeping, <laughs> to be honest, yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. When it comes to the translations and rotations, like that's why we kind of provide these visualization tools. It's like you can just check it like right away. Um, it's a, that's a good segue though into looking at um, openmc.dev, the plotter utility that we do have. So um, this is like a nice GUI for exploring OpenMC models in an interactive fashion uh, where you can move around it really easily. Um, you can explore things. You can do some basic tally visualization in these two after running a simulation. But this is like, this is the real ultimate way to explore an OpenMC model interactively once you've generated it because yeah, you can just move through it so much more effectively than going back and typing and typing, so. Okay, are any questions online, Shimon? Doing okay, good. All right, 
So now we're going to move on to lattices. So this is a construct in Monte Carlo Neutronics that will allow us to leverage the universes to really replicate our geometry now. So they're a really convenient way to repeat these universes and automatically translate them. I think I mentioned the pitch before. It will automatically handle situations like that for us. Um, so we don't have to explicitly define all of these different pin cells in an assembly and then a full core. Uh, so real one quick segue is we're just going to start defining some colors for our materials. So we'll call this matte colors. So that when we're doing our plots of these lattices, we're, it's really clear what we're looking at. So just a little bit of a uh, side journey here. I don't know what to call it. All right, there we go. So we're going to do U02, and that's going to be... Make that red. We'll have our steel be gray. We'll have the helium. Be a darker gray, <laughs> looks like. Let's have it be, no, that's fine. Or is that, oh, that's closer to white, isn't it? My bad. So it's just, it's an off-white. And then, what am I missing? Is that all four of our materials? One, two, sodium. Sodium's good to have. And we'll have the sodium be light blue in all of our subsequent plots here. Ah, right, we didn't call it helium. We called it he So I made a mistake with this uh, this key. So note that when we define these colors, we're really just passing in the material objects, setting a color on them. All right, so now, I think I mentioned before, we're gonna take an alternative approach to building our pin cell and building a universe as well as a result. So we are going to uh, use some convenience functions for building pin cells. We walked through it manually earlier today because it's valuable to understand how these different regions are constructed and how you build them and interpret them. Um, but there are a lot of really convenient functions for very quickly building pin cells up into lattices, assemblies, and cores in OpenMC. So we're just gonna explore an alternative method to uh, creating one of those. So the first thing we're gonna do is set the different radii for the pins, or for the, within the pin. And going to go up to the top Just copy this down so that I don't have to go back and forth. I should have put these into the notebook. So our pin radii, the first one's going to be 0 0.08020 in centimeters. The next one is 0 0.25565, 0 0.37112, 0 0.30499. Okay, so we're going to set it up so that we know all of the different surfaces that we need. Then we're going to create surfaces for this. We're going to do this in a fancy Python way. So we're going to call this the pin surfaces. So how do I usually do this? Okay. So we're going to create a Z cylinder. Well, yeah, Z cylinder. And that's going to be equal to the radius for each radius in my pin radii. So we're going to go ahead and execute that. So this is a fancy thing in Python. This is purely a Python thing. We can't claim it as OpenMC, but it's a really fancy way to create a list of objects. Um, so it's just saying if I were to kind of follow through the, the way that Python interprets and executes this, it's going to say for 
each radius in the pin radii, so this is like our loop variable that we've seen before, we're going to create a Z cylinder where the R parameter is set to that radius. And sure enough, if I look at that, you see our pin surfaces uh, have all been created for us. The correct radii. Oh, you right, Juwan? Okay. There's no number at the end. Okay, so we have our pin surfaces. Now we're gonna start using some of those convenience functions to build up our model. The other thing that we need to define ahead of time for this is just our pin materials. Um, and we're gonna do this in a specific order. So in the interior, we have helium, we have our fuel material, our UO2 is called, sorry. The UO2, we have our gap, and then the steel cladding, and then sodium. Good. All right, now we're going to use a convenience function in OpenMC to create a pin cell universe. Or, uh, no, I need to be careful with my naming pin universe. So we're going to be using this pin function that's part of the OpenMC model module. And so if we look at this, it's going to take in a set of surfaces, which we've already created. We have our list of cylinder surfaces. Uh, it's going to take all the items that to go between these. In our case, we use the word items to be generic because we could be filling with a universe or something crazy like that. In this case, we're just filling each section with a material. And we can also provide additional info on how to subdivide this if we wanted to do radial subdivision or axial subdivision of the pin cell. So this convenient method, convenience method is going to allow us to create a pin universe with one call. By passing in the surfaces, materials, And then we can plot this and we'll give it a width that's two by two centimeters. So there's our pin. And I hopefully nobody's too angry at me for how much time we spent on that this morning. But um, it can be that simple really with a lot of these convenient functions that we have available. So that gives us a pin universe to work with. And now based on that, we can start working with our um, lattices to build this up into a lattice. One thing we're gonna do real quick, and this is just kind of bookkeeping for later so that we don't have to come back and do it, is to grab the fuel cell um, out of this pin universe that we just created. So we can do that pretty easily just by saying, give me the new fuel cell that we just made. It's gonna come from the pin universe. And this, these universes have really So I can use the pin universe cell for the values uh, of the universe cells. We're going to get the first cell. So these were created in order from the inside to the out by this convenience function. First, there was the hole, the fuel region, the gap, the cladding, and then the outside, just like we did manually. Um, so rather than get the very first cell that was created, which is the hole, I want to get the fuel cell. So this is going to be the not the zeroth item. It's going to be the first item. And then we'll print that out to make sure that we got the one we were hoping for. Our values. What did I do here? I messed up something. Oh, yeah. Right, 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 right. I need to make this a list first so that I can index it. So we're going to wrap that in a call to make it a list. So I'll pause for a second um, so that we can make sure that everybody... 
uh, or we can address any questions. And for those of you still coding along, that you can kind of execute this because it's not super straightforward. Sorry about that. It's probably something we could improve in our API to make that easier. So, um, are there any questions? G1? Any? No questions on chat? Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, so the. Yeah, so let's take a look at what we, whoops, what this produces. So let's say this is our cell list. Uh, not universes, just universe. And then let's print that out to screen, print. So in this uh, material, description. This is going to be the very first cell. It's going to be filled with material 11, which is our helium. Um, and so that's why we want to skip that first entry. And put it in. Yeah, no problem. Yes. Good question. Yeah. Uh, so that's a really good question. Uh, the question was regarding burn up is OpenMC capable of modeling burn up in a molten salt reactor? The short answer is not yet. Uh, there's actually a, a pull request open, I believe, adding um, the ability to do fission product removal online as part of the burn up module. So that, like, it's in, like, literally in progress. Somebody's working on it right now. Um, and then also, in regards to MSR modeling, we're working on representing, properly representing uh, delayed neutron precursor drift based on a velocity field coming from like a CFD code or something like that. So for like a steady state velocity field, we can make sure that the delayed neutrons are appearing where they should in the model. Those, yeah, but those couple of things like are, are really limiting factors uh, for doing that sort of modeling. But it's, it's coming, it's, uh, it's sort of imminent, but yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, we're gonna kind of do our uh, final push here in modeling this assembly. So this is tackling the lattices in OpenMC. Um, so we're gonna define kind of a toy universe that's gonna help us visualize these and what they're doing. So the first thing we're gonna do is define a universe that's entirely water. Uh, so we're gonna make a water cell. Uh, why did I say water here? <laughs> Stuck in light water reactor world, I guess. Uh, we'll go to, uh, we'll make this a helium cell. So we're not going to specify a region. And this is something I probably should have touched on earlier, but if you don't supply a bounded region to a cell, it's going to just by default be an infinite cell. There's no surfaces for particles to hit. So the cell will go on forever. So we're gonna create that cell and then we're gonna create an infinite helium universe. And we're gonna pass in the cells that should be in that universe. And really in this case, it's just the infinite helium cell. All right, so the first thing we're gonna talk about cause they're a little bit more intuitive to handle Oh, and I should, yeah, okay, we can replot those things later, sorry. Uh, they're a little bit more intuitive to handle is rectangular lattices. Rectangular. Oh, 
it's just rect lattice, sorry. So there's a few pieces of information that we need to represent these lattices. Uh, so one is the pitch. We talked about that quite a bit before. Uh, Vladimir caught this earlier, but we are using a pitch that's specified for hexagonal geometry. Uh, so we're going to use a slightly larger pitch when we're defining our lattice here for the rectangular geometry. And then uh, we need to supply the lattice with the lower left corner of where it's going to start in space. And it's going to build that lattice up from that, from that corner. So for us, that's just going to be the origin. And then the lattice pitch itself is just these two pitch values. So we're specifying the pitch in both the x and y directions. We can do this in the z direction as well. If we wanted to have a totally different pitch for the x, y, and z directions, we could. Um, and it would build a 3D lattice for us in that way. Now the last thing that we need to specify is what universes go where inside of this lattice. And we're going to do this by providing a nested list. That list is going to contain just the set of universes that will go into our lattice in a particular order. So the way that it works is kind of outside in. So we're going to provide each row of the lattice in order. First with our pin universe, and then next to it, so we're going to kind of aim to do something like make a two by two lattice. Inside of this, we're going to have a pin. Inside of this is going to be just here. So the way that we do this is we kind of build inside out. So we start by defining what's going to go here in a list. And then in the next list, we're going to do the inverse. So our infinite helium is going to come first. And then those two, those two lists are going to go into a list. So the idea is like we're going to define these two things in its own row in a list. These are going to be second row and another list, and then those are going to go into a larger, uh, a larger list to represent all the universes that go into this. All right, so now we're going to just make a quick universe that's, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. We're going to make a quick example universe. And we're just going to fill that with, I'll break this out a little bit. So we're going to fill, we're going to create an example cell and fill it with that lattice. Then we're going to create a universe that just has that cell in it. Now we're going to do some plotting. Okay. I'm going to pull in some code um, just for the sake of time. So for this example universe, we're going to plot three times the pitch in X and Y. We're going to set the origin to the pitch so that we've kind of, we're kind of centering. Because if we set our origin to 0, 0, we're going to get kind of a view that goes off the side of this lattice. So we're going to move our origin up. And then we're going to color by material. We've been coloring by cell so far. So we're going to color by material instead. And then we're going to use this kind of notation to pass all these plot arguments to this. Oh, yeah, and we want to use matte colors. There we go. So this is kind of our replicated geometry. We've taken our new pencil universe, and now we've used it in two different places. Helium universes in the locations we were hoping for. Okay, and then just one thing to quickly touch on is the meaning of outer for a lattice. This is true for both rectangular and hexagonal lattices. 
Uh, for any lattice, when you get to the outside of it, you can see here that nothing is defined outside of this lattice, but you can provide a universe to define any of the space out, outside of the lattice for you. So if particles do reach that reason, region for whatever reason, uh, you have something there. And so we can just make this uh, maybe, yeah, we'll make that our infinite helium or Now, if we do that plot again, it's a little subtle, but maybe, yeah, it's kind of washed out on the projector. Let's do this. Change our helium cell to sodium. Okay, and there we go. So now we see that instead of having nothing out there, we have something. And I think that'll allow us to move on to hexagonal lattices. I'm going to keep chugging forward here so that we can get to the exercise description. But I'll hang around, of course, to answer any questions that we need. So uh, we took a look at rectangular lattices because they're hopefully a little bit more intuitive. The indexing is pretty, um, you know, it's kind of 0, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. It follows along with like a two dimensional indexing structure. So if we have like a two dimensional, it'll be 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, a hex lattice, and similar to the rectangular lattices, we're going to need to set a center. So rather than an origin, we're setting a center here, and we do differentiate that because the way these are built is slightly different. And then we'll need to specify a pitch. Now, the question that probably comes to mind is why are we only specifying a single pitch as opposed to two? So for hexagonal lattices, boy, I really wish I uh, could, was more of an artist right now, but I'm not. So for hexagonal lattices as opposed to rectangular lattices, the way that the indexing is going to work is we have uh, it goes by rings, so if we were to have a hex lattice with only one pin cell, it's going to be in the center. And then we're going to start somewhere in the, in the rotation around the ring, and this is going to be our pitch. And then similarly, as we go around the ring, then we're going to have a pitch here. The next entry, uh, yeah, and a pitch there, here, and so on. Yeah, it's a hex, how about that? Um, so... But what that means is to define a 2D structure as we continue to go out in rings, we really only need one pitch value as opposed to the rectangular lattice where there, it's required to have two. And here we'll also set our... Pitch should be... Uh, yes, because even in a hex lattice, we're doing 2D models right now, but even in a hex lattice, uh, we could have a pitch for the axial dimension for the for the hex. We're just doing 2D today. So. Um, let's see. For the outer. We're going to define a infinite. Well, let's do this. Infinite sodium. Uh, infinite sodium cell. And then infinite sodium universe. So again, filling a cell with sodium, but no region. So it just goes on forever. We'll specify a universe where the only cell
infinite sodium cell, and then we'll apply that as our outer. Okay. Uh, so one thing that's kind of nice is we can take this hex lattice. And we can say, show me the indices for print, probably, print. Show me the indices for a certain number of rings. And it's going to tell us what the index is. So we actually start from the outside. I think it's more intuitive to start from the inside, but this is how it's coded up. So um, we start from the outside, and we start going around the rings in a counter or clockwise fashion. And then we get to the next ring, and it starts with one. And then it goes to one, 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 two, one, three, and then we get to the middle, and it's two, zero. But this is really useful in visualizing like where is each universe going uh, as I build them up. Uh, oh, just a little bit. Oh, this, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. I'll keep that. I'll keep that. Yeah, yeah. The outer outer universe for a hex lattice is going to be sodium. Um, so this also describes the order of these rings or the order of these indices also describes how we're going to supply universes to the hex lattice. So the first list that we're going to supply is going to represent all the universes in the outermost ring and then the innermost ring and then finally, uh, or sorry, the middle ring and then finally the inner ring. Now we're going to have more than that in our actual assembly model, but thanks to doing this in Python, it's not going to be as painful as it might seem to define this. So kind of the goal here for what we're trying to get goal for what we're trying to get to looks something like this. So for us, it's pretty straightforward in a way because all of our hexagonal cells are filled with the same pin cell. And then we're going to have a couple cells to tack on to the outside. So in order to define, uh, let's see. In order to define these, uh, these universes, we can say we want to make a list of lattice universes. And then based on the number of rings in our image or our specification, how many rings are there if you want? Do you know offhand? Five, excellent. So there's five rings. Uh, so this list is going to contain, at each, each entry, the set of universes for a given ring, starting from the outside and going in. So four ring in range of five. Oops. This is just all range is doing here is supplying a set of values zero to four for us to generate these rings. I want to make that clear. We are going to append to the lat lattice universes a new list. And then we're going to say for any ring that's greater than the first ring, it's really equal to this ring value. Okay, so the number of universes in any ring other than the first one is equal to the, to the, to the number of the ring times six, just by nature of being a hexagonal geometry. And so we're going to say, provide us a number of universes um, that's six by the ring unless for the first one that would give us zero and in that case it's just going to be one. So that's kind of what this uh, little function is doing here. That's a built-in Python function, nothing, nothing that I did by any means. And then we're just going to uh, expand a list of universes. Oops, universe. So we see here we get this 
nice long list of lattice universes. It's nested, and if we look at the first, yeah, the first entry, uh, then we're going to see it just has one universe, and if we look at the last entry, it's got a whole bunch of universes. Okay, so that's our outermost ring specification. Um, now, the way that we, based on the indexing that we see above, we need the outer ring to come first, and so we can actually reverse this when we set it on the, on the hex lattice. So the lattice universes, and there's a nice fancy way to just reverse a list by doing this, and it's just saying, go from the, this is saying, go from the beginning to the end, but do it backwards is the negative one at the end. So throwing some random kind of fancy Python stuff here in at the end. Okay, now we need a uh, cell to contain all this in. So we're gonna say, uh, let's see, we need a cell, but we also need a surface. And we'll say that's going to be, yeah, four centimeters. It's fine. We'll make it a, ba a vacuum boundary. And then we are going to create a cell where the region is the inside of that outer surface. The fill is our hex lattice. Now we're going to create a root universe. And now that we've done that, we can go ahead and plot it. So we'll say the width on this is going to be two times the outer radius of that cell we just made. So we'll call that 8 by 8. Uh, let's color it by material. And make sure that we apply our material colors. Oh yeah, and one other thing that I haven't been doing, but it's pretty nifty, is if you are p providing material colors to OpenMC, it'll also create a legend for you alongside. Let's make this a little bit larger. So I'm just gonna up the pixels, pixels equals, make it 600 by 600. Okay, so we're getting close. Um, do I have another five minutes? So we're getting really close. So now we've built this whole um, this whole assembly that's representing this uh, fuel assembly of the CEFR. Now, what can what do we notice about this image versus this one here? What's different, maybe? Yeah, right, so the, the flat edge or the rotation of this lattice is a little bit different than the one we see um, in our image. So rotating this lattice is relatively easy. There's two orientations that we use for hex lattices. By default, the orientation for the hex lattice is Y, meaning that the flat edge, to me, this is how I remember it anyways, the flat edge of the hex lattice is going in the y direction. Now if we just change this to x, we can go ahead and replot this root universe and it's gonna rotate the whole lattice. So the orientation is now where we want it to be. Okay, we're almost there, looking pretty good. So the next thing we need to do, if we notice in this image, we see that there are some regions on the outside. The steel um, and then the outer boundary of the entire problem. So OpenMC does have a plane that's arbitrarily, uh, that where you can provide arbitrary coordinates for the normal vector of the plane. However, 
to do that for these off angle surfaces would be a, a pain. So we tried to make it easier. And we have a method that is the hexagonal prism. And so that allows us to just create a hex prism with a specified edge length along each edge of the prism. And we can use that to more easily create uh, the outer edges to create the ductwork and then uh, the exterior sodium for the, to represent the space between our assemblies. So, we can say the inner section of the duct is gonna be a hexagonal prism. Uh, looking at what we need to provide, one is gonna be an edge length. The edge length for us here is going to be specified in the TCS doc as um, the orientation I want to make X And then by default, that's gonna have a transmission boundary type, so we don't need to supply that info. The outer section of the duct is gonna be a little bit larger. And then finally, we're gonna have the outer assembly boundary as well. So same orientation as the other two, but this time, this is gonna be the outermost surface of our assembly. So we need to make sure that we specify a boundary type. Which is gonna be a reflective boundary condition. We can go ahead and execute that cell. Okay, so now we can create a cell that contains our duct. Um, so we can call that So everything, that can, everything that's in the lattice can be our, a cell where the region is everything that's inside of our inner duct universe. And we're gonna fill that with our hex lattice. Oh, right. So the, what's returned from the hexagonal prism is actually a, a region in and of itself. So as opposed to it being a surface that's a hexagonal prism like a, yeah, like a composite surface or something like that, this is actually the, the half space or the space representing the inside of that prism. So I don't need to provide a minus sign here when I'm creating this cell. All right, next up, we're gonna go ahead and create our assembly universe. And we'll add this lattice cell. And then I'm gonna go back up and steal some of the plotting parameters that we had here. Drop them in. But we don't wanna be plotting the old universe, we want the new one. Cool, so now when we plot this, we see here, looks like my, uh, oh, did I do one, two? There's six rings. One, two, three, four. That looks like five to me. Five, yeah. So what's my, I must have messed up my edge length. That looks right. Mm -hmm. Oh, hmm. oh, maybe 
it is too large. All right. Let's make sure that's right. Zero point. Uh, I guess I can just change it. Hang on. Catch. That does look pretty far apart, doesn't it? There we go. Well, that's the root plot, but it looks closer together. All modeling steps. Cool. Okay, thanks, G1. So I had the pitch a little bit too high if you were following along with me. I think I set the pitch variable, um, but it should be 0 0.695, and you can correct it just with this set of code. You can do that anywhere. It's actually kind of an interesting thing uh, that it corrected it both in this universe that we put inside of the cylindrical cell, but also down in this cell where we placed it. So, Okay, we're almost there. We just need to provide now a cell for the duct. So we'll call this the duct cell. And this is going to be a region that is, we're going to use a new geometry operator. This is called the complement, this tilde here. And so this says no matter what your region is, Give me everything that's the opposite of that. It's like a negative space um, in art. And we're going to combine that with everything that's inside of the outer duct surface. And this one, we're just going to fill with, fill with a material. And then one nice thing that we can do is just dynamically build this model up by adding this cell. And then if we, the same object, the same assembly universe after adding that cell, we can replot. And here we see we have our duct added. So a nice way to dynamically build these models. This, is, this whole process is very similar to how somebody would do it uh, for the benchmark problem, I would imagine. Jiwan would know better than I, because she actually did it. But <laughs> um, and then finally, we need a little bit of space on the outside of the assembly. So uh, let's take a look at that. We're going to do the outer cell. That is going to be a region where, similarly, we're using something that's the complement or the negative of the outer duct region. And everything that's inside of the, what did I name that? The assembly boundary. And then we'll add that to our assembly universe as well. So add that cell, <coughs> the outer cell, then go ahead and replot that. Hmm, I don't actually see it. Outer duct. Oh, I didn't fill it with anything. That would be good. So I'll go ahead and fill that with sodium. Done. Oh, I have two outer cells, don't I? Uh, well, now I've done it. So, just to explain what's going on here, I managed to add a cell twice to my universe. Um, so, what I think I'm going to do here is just kind of reset it. Uh, I'm going to say our assembly universe. So just to clarify, these two cells are duplicated. One of them is filled with sodium, and the other one is filled with vacuum, essentially. Um, and they're on top of each other now in my geometry. So to kind of recover here, I'm just going to more clearly specify what cells I want in here. So I have the lattice cell. It could, yeah. Do you want me to do that instead? Do it. Either way. Uh, so, alternative path, I guess, would be to remove it. So, I want to remove a certain entry from this list, and it's going to be number 25, cell number 25. So, 
if I remove that now and I look at my assembly, cells, that one's been removed. And now hopefully when I plot this again, there we go. We'll see some sodium around the outside of the duct. Um, Good. There's a short, short question. Um, what is the precision we have to specify in input of geometry? The precision, precision. The precision necessary. Yeah, precision. Uh, it's kind of up to how accurately you'd like to model the geometry you're looking at, really. Um, so it's kind of kind of arbitrary. Like if you if your model is really sensitive to geometric changes, you want to be really precise. For the benchmark model, for example, I think we had extremely accurate measurements of these different parameters. Uh, and then there's also something to consider is like if you have expansion, like these are probably calculated as a result of expansion in the core also, which is why we have so many decimal places on our geometric values. So, um, okay, last, yeah, yeah, sounds good. So last of the last, we're just going to add, um, we're just going to turn this into a 3D model by adding bounding planes on the top and the bottom. So just small axial change, but then we'll have a 3D model at the end of this. All right, so now we're gonna say, we'll say the upper plane, uh, not a Z cylinder, it's gonna be a Z plane. Oof. It's gonna be Z zero, uh, it's gonna be at our upper, so we're gonna set that at 20 centimeters. And the boundary type is gonna be vacuum. We'll set a lower plane at Z0 of negative 20 centimeters, so 40 centimeters in height total. Again, with the vacuum boundary condition, we're going to create a root cell that is going to be equal to yeah, okay. I just want to make sure I get this part right, sorry. Uh, the, it's going to be a cell whose region is going to be above the lower plane. It's going to be also, so and below the upper plane. And it's going to be the inside of the assembly boundary. And now finally, 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 we're going to make a root universe Cells are the root cell. What did I mess up here? Universe or extra R on the end. And now we can uh, finally, finally create a geometry. So we can say geometry, our model geometry is equal to an open MC geometry where the root of that geometry or the root universe is the root universe we've created above. Now, if all went well, we can go and execute and run this geometry. Hopefully not. Oh, what did I mess up? Oh, yeah, what happened with the fission? Fixed, but I can't remember what it was. That should be fine though. Yeah. All right, well, let's do this. G1, do you want to continue? I'll figure out what's going on. No, I'll correct it. Okay, okay, I think it's now like we are running now a bit great, a little bit longer now. If you 
F. As a question, Javon will go. Could you stop the sharing? The oh, yeah, sure, sure. Okay. <coughs> right. So now let, let you learn everything about the more or less the details of the S CFR reactor. Now we can see the real example from how it was calculated. And it took not one day, it took much longer. And we will do it in one day. Do you see this screen cl clearly? Yeah, yeah, perfect. It's fine? Okay. Perfect. Uh, yeah, let me start. I'm Jiwon from Kelly, South Korea. And here you learned many things about the OpenMC, how to model the pin cell and lattices. And yeah, so uh, this is uh, the Activity, the activity materials for modeling the fuel sub-assembly of the CEFR. So um, <clears throat> here is the table of contents. This, is, this material includes uh, what we have to uh, consider to uh, model the benchmark problem uh, based on the measurement data and real the core. And, um, an appendix for uh, refer the refer to modeling uh, model the CFR core. Here, let me explain. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, so this is the project. What you will do in this uh, activities. Here is the list to do during the group activity two. Uh, you will uh, model the a single fuel sub assembly of a CFR and <clears throat> and the CFR the scratch input file uh, the OpenMC scratch input file will be uh, provided and you can find it in the Jupyter notebook and uh, CFR tutorials directory and there is an input file with some blanks. So you will fill the data and simulate the OpenMC using this that scratch info file. So first of all, uh, you will process the data from the 20, 20 Celsius degree to 250 Celsius degree based on the measured information. And uh, you, the first of all, uh, calculation atomic density for fuels and structure material, the two different stainless steel and sodium coolant. And then you will uh, expand to calculate the dimension, the geometric dimension. But you will consider the only fuel region. I mean that there is a fuel sub-assembly consists of the uh, lower reflectors and spring regions and fuels and the upper, re upper reflector region and others. But you will consider the only fuel regions like fissile fuel and blanket fuels, okay? Then uh, filling in OpenMC input scratch file, uh, define the surfaces that make up fuel sub-assembly, especially the fuel regions, and define pins and lattices in 2D for fuel region and stacking universes, universes in 3D, and set the, setting the calculation options, like such as basic options, plotting, and tallies. And then uh, you will do post-process post the visualized data. And uh, the mission is uh, you need to get the, all the same k effective result from the four groups and um, and then visualize the pin power distributions and flux distributions. But the pin power distributions, the the input for uh, plotting pin power distribution is, is al already in it. So you will not need to revise that part because it's a little bit complicated, so you can use that directly. But uh, the, for the plotting the flux spectrum, you have to uh, make your own input script, okay? Okay, so what, which data do we need for the modeling the CFR? Um, it's easy. We discussed about in the morning and whole day, uh, we will consider about material and geometry only in these activities. So, <coughs> 
Uh, yeah, so list of materials comprising the core, like fuel, blanket resins, and coolant and control rod and structural materials. And we uh, need the material properties such as masses, densities, and linear expansion coefficients, and their isotopic compositions. Because we need the, the material information in the number density, so we, have, we need those kind of data. And in terms of geometry, uh, we need the, we have to expand actually and radially, so we also need the, ge the dimension information and linear expansion coefficient for the expanding the geometry. Okay. So uh, the CFR, the startup test, has been carried out the in with zero power and cold state but the temperature is 250 Celsius degree. So we call, it, this is a cold state because it's not the half, half full power. And uh, we consider that the core is, uh, core is, um, no, 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 sorry. We consider that the core, the temperature is um, the, Mm, fixed as 250 Celsius degree in all the regions. Like there's no difference between the region by region, top or top and bottom. So, and then consider that expanded in uh, the all the material is uh, isothermally uh, increased. So uh, please consider only the temperature is fixed at the 250 Celsius degree and yeah, this is the basic information, and let's collect and process the material data. So, uh, in the fuel sub assembly, it consists of uh, six different materials. One is illicit uh, uranium fuel, uranium oxide, and depleted uranium oxide for blanket regions, and the stainless steel, the 1550 titanium for cladding and spacer wire, spacer wires, and the other stainless steel for, uh, of uh, 316 titanium for uh, structures, except cladding and space, spacer wires. And the gap is filled with helium gas, and the coolant is sodium. But we uh, assume that the, in the coolant, we consider that the coolant is uh, made up with the pure sodium. So there will be another the isotopes, but the fraction is really uh, negligible to uh, benchmark modeling the neutronics benchmark. So we will consider only the sodium 100%. Okay. Yeah. So here is the data for the linear expansion coefficient uh, for uh, those materials. And the right, the most right hand uh, line shows the name used for the OpenMC input. So, okay. So, uh, yeah. So, in a, in order to for, perform the calculations, uh, we have to get the number density information from all the data. So let's consider the fuel materials first. Um, <clears throat> so this all the specification is given uh, at the temperature of 20 Celsius degree. So we have to uh, match to match the operating temperature of 250 Celsius degree. The material densities should be adjusted using corresponding linear expansion coefficient, and uh, using the following following these uh, equations. So uh, this uh, epsilon, epsilon uh, the constants can be uh, calculated by uh, linear expansion coefficient and delta temperature. So it, should, it will be uh, 230 Celsius degrees. And um, this information is and then uh, decreasing the, the density according to the thermal expansion, then the, the density at 250 Celsius degree can be uh, 
calculated by the density at the Celsius, uh, the 20 Celsius degree, and divided by the epsilon and cubic centimeter. Ah uh, no, the by the uh, epsilon because this is the 3D model, so we have to divide it by um, epsilon. Uh, Power to three, yeah, thank you. Yeah. And here, um, in the CFR benchmark, uh, they provide the measurement data of the masses of uranium oxide and uranium U-235. Um, Like uh, the atomic ratio should be matched with the uh, uranium oxide and uranium and U-235, but sometimes the the measured data is a little bit different. Like if they provide the U-235 mass, but if we uh, calculate it reversely, then the ratio between the uranium and U-235 are a little bit different. When we uh, recalculate, get the mass of U-238. So. Uh, <clears throat> In the table 10, uh, they provide the, the uranium information like this. It is in the appendix. Um, yeah, here it is. So you will uh, use the average value of this uh, U-235 uh, mass. And then you will get the reverse calculation to get the U uranium-238 and ox oxide, okay? So this uh, average value is uh, like measured with the around, yeah, 89 sub-assemblies, and then they are uh, divided, like they get measured all the uranium mass of uh, 89 fuel sub-assemblies, and then get the, this average data. So uh, please use this. Uh, data for uh, get the uranium, the number density information. And here is the, how we get the uranium, uh, the, the atomic density of, for the fuels. So first of all, uh, we, so we know the uh, mass of uranium-235 for one fuel sub-assembly then we have to uh, get the volume of the fuel in the one fuel sub-assemblies. Then uh, the total volume for fuel region can be uh, calculated by equation five. And then uh, to, uh, in order, and then put uh, this data into uh, the equation six, then you can get the mass data of the Oh, ground density over U thirty uh, U two thirty five, and then uh, you can get the uh, the other isotopes uh, mass data. Okay, so and then you will know how to uh, invert from ground density to number density. So please get this data and then uh, fill this table. And this number density will be used in the opponent's input. And for the structural material, uh, they provide the total mass of uh, stainless steel and the fraction of the isotopes, like uh, um, iron or nickel and titanium other airs. So uh, <coughs> here is the, the procedure how to you get the number density of for the structural material. So first of all, uh, obtain the atomic mass and natural abundance of all specific isotopes. And in the Jupyter notebook, we provide this information in, as a text file, so you can refer to that information. And then calculate the atomic mass of element from uh, isot isotopic atomic masses and their natural abundance. Then third, calculate the mass density of elements from the total stainless steel mass density and provide it relative mass. And then calculate the number density of uh, element using the elemental 
atomic mass and elemental density. Then uh, calculate the number density of specific nuclide from the elemental number density and natural abundance, and adjust the number density to match the operating temperature of two, uh, 50 Celsius degrees. So in this uh, procedure, then you can get the, all the number density information for the stainless steels. And then this information also will be used in the open and simple. So if the, in this material, the color in, in blue, then please uh, read it carefully and then uh, you uh, fill this data in the open and simple too, okay? And for the sodium coolant, this is a liquid metal, so they provide the uh, density of liquid sodium equations uh, as below. So just insert the specific temperature and then get you will get the gram density of sodium, then convert into the atomic density and fill this uh, sodium material in the open and simple file. So those are how we get the, uh, the material information. And then we have to consider about the geometry for modeling. So the CFR core uh, model is used, the, used in training courses based on the hierarchical approach which tries to follow the natural core ge geometry levels. So the model is comprises uh, in four hierarchical levels it's shown in figure, like 3D rector core and 3D, sub, 3D sub assemblies and 2D lattices and 2D pincers. So we can decompose in these four levels and uh, we will design from the 2D pincer and then stacking in 2D pins and lattices and 3D sub assemblies. So, <clears throat> for the geometry in, first of all, you can categorize the, the fuel sub-assemblies in um, 11 lattices. It is composed of a lower connector and bottom and end, of, end plug and gas plenum and blanket fuel fuel region and upper blanket fuel region, spring, and top end plug, upper connector, and upper shield, and head. Um, <clears throat> so he, this data is given by um, the, from, it is extract, extracted from the, the benchmark problem, and then our right, da, right side of data is, uh, we pre-calculated uh, to reach to get the uh, expansion to get at the uh, 250 Celsius degrees. So um, based on the linear expansion coefficient, please uh, calculate uh, the height of the blanket and fuel regions and use this data into the OpenMC input. And in the neutron expansion mark, we don't need to uh, model everything in details. So like in the fuel region, we have to uh, model as detailed as, as we can, as possible as we can. But uh, like outside of the fuel region, some region we can uh, simplify it because it is not affected in the neutronics uh, impact. So uh, in this case, for the space wire, uh, like in the fast reactor, uh, we don't use uh, the spacer grid usually. So fuel cladings are um, assembled with a space wire between cladding and cladings. So this is very thin wire uh, will be mixed with the cladding. So when you calculate the thickness of cladding, then you need to consider the volume of this space wire and then in, um, increase the cladding thickness a little bit, okay? But there are uh, several ways to consider space wire. The first thing is the mixed with the cladding and the other 
one is mixed with the coolant region. But in the fast director, the impact is not that big difference and cladding like mixed into the cladding is much uh, simpler and easier way. So uh, we recommend to use this method this way. And for the spring region, it is uh, homogenized uh, with the steel and helium gas with the volume fraction. But we uh, pre-calculated this region, so you, you don't need to uh, consider about this uh, value, okay? And then the supporting plug in fuel rod is not modeled, and rounded corners in fuel pellet also not modeled, and handling head in fuel sub-assembly, it is um, modeled as hexagonal wrappers of different thicknesses. And the nodal sectors, um, the under at the bottom is not modeled. Okay. And the uh, OpenMP's input uh, input file um, <clears throat> here is the naming convention used in the OpenMP's input. So to improve readability, we uh, the uh, discursive names were used when uh, possible, and the object names were made from the compound keyword using uh, underscore and character as a separator. So uh, the surface, na surface names start with the short keyword pointing the surface type, and the cell name start with C on the bar, where C stands for cell. So if you model the cell region, then it starts with C, on the bar, like fuel region and fission, fissile fuel region start with zero and one, two, three, four. And pin names start with P on the bar, where P stands for pin, and the lattices name start with L on the bar, where L stands for lattice. And the universes start, universe names start with U on the bar, where U stands for universe. And sub-assembly names start with a, uh, where A stands for assemblies. <coughs> In the uh, technical course series, there are uh, more around uh, 11 and 12 different sub-assembly types. So this labeling is very important because it's easy to um, make an input script and recognize that. But in this uh, workshop, we are modeling only the fuel regions. So maybe you will uh, just uh, concentrate it on the last uh, names because it is different in every lattice is used. Okay. Yeah, here the how to build the fuel sub-assembly geometry in the OpenMC. So first of all, define the material and surfaces uh, used for construct of fuel pins and sub-assemblies. And then define the 2D pins uh, for the upper blanket, fuel, and lower blanket regions. Then uh, define the 2D lattices and 3D fuel sub-assemblies. So I already visualized in the document, but um, you will design only these three regions for blanket and fuel regions. And for the stacking the 3D, um, you will not need to revise uh, for that region because uh, it is already defined in the input file. So if you uh, succeed fill this those data, then the 3D, the CFR fuel server assembly will run well without any errors. Okay. So. Okay. So. Here are the activities for um, this workshop, and this is the appendix. You can refer the data. Um, I provide the dimension for the fuel rod, and this the draw for the fuel sub-assemblies. You will get the uh, dimension from these uh, pages and the fuel and observer's material information is, are here, and also stainless steel. Okay. Uh, so 
here is the Jupyter Notebook, and you can find the CFR on the tutorial notebook file. And there is, um, I will give uh, the simple mission on every uh, blocks, like starting with define the defined the materials. So here, uh, fill atomic number density data for the fuel and blanket and stainless steel. Then just fill the number in here. And after that, they define the surfaces for pin and wrapper and extra surfaces and hex cores. So find the the pin dimensions and then give the numbers in here. Then define pins. Yes, please define the pins. Sorry? Yeah, the data is missing, so the participants should. Here? Yeah, 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 this region, you need to increase the height of your regions. Yeah, please fill the data. And then, the define, define the pin for the upper blanket and fish, the fuel and lower blanket regions here. Also, define the lattices for fuel regions only. Here, the other regions is already defined and you will consider for these three regions. And then uh, below is nothing to do because it's, it is already defined. And at the end, the OpenMC will be uh, run automatically with those figures. If you rerun, then you cannot see this information because it, some data is missed in this input file. But this will be the hint for your activity. And here for input for tallies. And there is a, the visualization input option for the pin power distributions. So um, below this input, uh, please uh, add the input script for the visualize the neutron flux spectrum for the fuel reasons. Okay, that's all for your activity and good luck. Relatively easy with help of this document, so you can complete it like tomorrow, and then you will give a task for modification of this to compare it between groups. I just had one more thing to share. Sorry, we didn't get that last uh, model piece to run. Did this come in well? Yeah. So uh, I made a mistake. And in the root cell um, here, we didn't fill it with anything. And so we were getting this error that said there were no fission sites because there was nothing in the geometry. Oh, sorry. Can you hear? Okay. okay. So, sorry. Uh, I, I created this cell, but we didn't fill it with anything. And so when we went to run the simulation, it was saying no fission sites because, well, there was nothing in the model at all. <laughs> so, uh, so if you want to try to run this um, to correct that, make sure that you fill the root cell with the, uh, with the assembly universe, and then you should have a successful uh, OpenMC run. So just wanted to note that before we end of the day, end on a successful simulation. You saw it in chat already and completed it. Okay, so now we are running out of time. I think that uh, it was very intensive, a lot of information. You will have a chance also to talk both to, to Patrick and Javon. If you have any questions, please start this group exercise. Once you complete this, I mean, this is CFR model and run it successfully it, because it's, you, you know more or less the results, then we, they will give you some modifications, different probably for different groups. I don't know exactly, but maybe the same for the same group, which you should do like individually, I mean, in groups, but without knowing, in blind, without knowing the result. And then on Friday, one of you will present this result and more or less how did you do briefly in presentation uh, just, just on, on for all between us all other groups so now i suggest we move to without delay 
we, because we delayed already a lot, we moved to I also I'm not participated, not presented today, also participated. One by one. I think all lecturers here will be go to the one, two, three sessions. You have three minutes to talk. Please keep it. Of time. And several minutes, couple of minutes more to respond to the questions. Thank you. Thank you. And just I want to say the result of this, we will select two or maybe three best posters who will be awarded also some money from ICTP. I'm not sure how much, not big not big, but essential amount of money, which help you to enjoy Trieste more. Our virtual is finished. For the virtual? For the, well, for the virtual part, uh, we don't have poster session, on, on, unfortunately, but we also I invite you to repeat this, these exercises in the virtual part, and you can, if you have any questions, please use chat, and tomorrow, in this case, and submit your questions to Javon and Tupac. And just uh, so this discussion on group activities that we will have on uh, Wednesday and Thursday will include for both, for OpenFOM and OpenMC, so there will be the opportunity to discuss more and ask more questions as well. So thank you, our virtual audience, and we will see you tomorrow. Well,